Thanks for coming. We've got a story about the company. And I've been on a crusade to get, uh, I started doing this with the professors at Crotonville, which I'll tell you about in a minute. But uh, we want everybody in the company to get a feel of the business they're in and the company they're in and how they fit in the company. It's a description of General Electric today, where it's been, why it's done what it's, what it's done, and uh, where we think it's going. Uh, since I, at Phoenix, at the officers meeting, asked uh, everyone to be sure and tell every employee what uh, this was all about, I think I had to put my money where my mouth is and be sure that every employee in headquarters gets a chance to see what we're trying to do, what it's all about. In the course of running the Crotonville courses, we would have people go to Crotonville, spend three weeks there, then I'd go over at the end of the course and would have a question and answer period. And invariably, the questions would relate to one believing that no one had ever been to the course regarding the company's plans and what it was doing. So it was clear the faculty to start with, wasn't sure as to what GE's strategy was and why we were doing and what we were do why we were doing things we were doing. So the purpose of this presentation initially was to explain in very clear language to 85 professors from Harvard to Stanford and, ar and around the company, uh, around the country, just what our strategy is, why we're doing it, what we've done, why we've done it, and where we intend to go, so that they could impart that knowledge, hopefully, in a consistent fashion to all the students who end up at Crotonville. So with that background, we developed a presentation that uh, I, I went there and spoke to this crowd and then spent some three and a half hours in the pit debating with them the logic of the presentation and the arguments that we were making for the case. And the question and the things that we'll be talking about today are a dialogue and a buy-in on what the world marketplace realities are what GE's approach to those world marketplace realities has been and will be. And then a micro internal issue that gets at this question of an unstructured, more li liberated environment can come to mean, hopefully, if we do it right, more opportunity, more fun, more excitement, and not just more work. And those are the two issues that, uh, that uh, we, we discussed that day and we'll try and deal, deal with today as we go through this presentation. The first chart gets back to a question uh, that, that is asked at Cronville a lot, so it's asked across the company. Are we buying and selling every day willy-nilly, or do we have a consistent theory of the case as to where we are going? Here is a 1981 chart. This presentation was given at the Pier Hotel in December of 81 that described what we were going to do in General Electric. We were going to invest in those businesses that were inside the circle, and then we're going to take those businesses outside the circle and fix, close, or sell them. Well, in 1981, that was demon-like. It was aggressive. Restructuring was bad. How can you say fix, close, or sell? Uh, it began some of the genesis of Neutron Jack. It did a lot of things. I mean, that basically was the beginning of, holy cow, the world is going to be slower growth, tougher place to do business in. And only the winners will, in fact, win this game. Since that time, this is now passe language. Companies are gobbling up each other. All kinds of things are happening. You can't pick up a paper in the day where somebody isn't restructuring, t tipping things upside down, buying one another, et cetera. But this was our view in 1981. If you come to 1986, five years later, and take a look at what those three circles look like, on the left, GECC had grown. It had acquired Employers Reinsurance Company, insurance co company in Kansas City, Missouri, and it had acquired Kitta Peabody. NBC came with RCA and, and entered the services circle. And you can see the asterisk there showing that. And Communications and Services was formed out of a series of three or four RCA businesses plus our own communications businesses. On the right in the circle, aerospace, GE's aerospace, was combined with RCA's and about double the size of those businesses. And all the power systems businesses were put together in one single unit. So semiconductors, outside the circle there, we had our semiconductor business. It was combined with RCA's. 
as were the two consumer electronics businesses, GEs and RCA. That whole list outside the circle, though, was pretty well sold by that time or gone. So the businesses inside the circle, though, the ones that didn't have an asterisk on them, totally untouched over five years. We invested in those businesses, and we did fix, close, or sell the ones outside the circle. The point being, from 81 to 86, the strategy was consistent. Coming to this particular chart here, which describes uh, a view very early in 1988, every time I look at this circle, I think of that we can, in fact, think in more than three circles. We have that ability. We don't show it too often, but uh, it is something that uh, is, is part of our mentality. We have a strategy that's been consistent of saying we want to be number one in the global marketplace in every business that we are in. And there's a whole series of actions over here on the right that say, with the exception of two businesses, the appliance business where Philips uh, was just sold its appliance business to Whirlpool, and in power systems where ASEA and Brown Bovary, a Swedish and a Swiss company, merged, we have enhanced our relative position around the world against everybody. In two of these, we've been outflanked by two good maneuvers, one by Whirlpool with Philips, and one by ASEA Brown Bovary merging, giving our power systems business some problems going forward. Not short term, but long term. On the left, we have a concept that we always operate under, that we can differentiate any of these businesses. We can invest for the long term, we can squeeze for the short term in any one of these businesses, but we are saying that the total of these businesses now can grow at one and a half to two times the gross national product. That's important because throughout the 60s and 70s, GE was perceived as a gross national product company. It grew exactly at the gross national product. We are now saying we can grow, and in fact it did. We are saying it can grow now at one and a half to two times the GNP, and that should enhance the value of this company if we can deliver on what we are saying. And down the bottom here, we are showing a management system which we are trying to get at which is to delegate more responsibility down, to get rid of the, some of the layers, because in the end, we are trying to liberate people to act. Less control, more act. Because what do you get out of this? You get more fast-moving communication, you get speed, you get all the things you need in a faster, globally moving market. Our objective, very simply, is to be a big company, big and powerful, and at the same time, a small company, the grocery store next door. Now that is tough. The first one is much easier, being big and global. You can acquire, you can get bigger, but being small, as Bob and some others who are trying to get rid of some of the bureaucracy we have here are working on, is a tougher issue for us. It's harder. We've got 100 years of practices and procedures and rules and regula regulations that, in fact, bind up a big corporation. And one of the objectives we have is to be big and small simultaneously. Out of this presentation then comes a new look at how this whole company works. And it's called the GE Growth Engine. On the left, we have what we do here at headquarters, if you will. The corporate exec executive officer, all, all of us in this room and our associates. Our objective here, we sell nothing, we make nothing. We're simply, if you will, overhead, all of us. Our job is to multiply the resources we have, the human re resources as well as the financial resources and the best practices. For example, move people from business A to business B to add strengths, to look at the people allocation across the business. Take Bob Wright, who now runs NBC from GEFS, to move a John Trainee from mobile communications to medical systems, to move the key people into the key jobs, to al allocate capital to the businesses, give money to where the growth is, the opportunities are, squeeze the money from those businesses that don't have it, allocate our capital from business A to business B, and then to take the technical resources or the best practices, we like to call it, whether it be out of Fred Gehry's op operation or Roger Strelo's environmental organization, or, or Art Puccini, Puccini's employee relations operate, move best practices from business A to business B to business C. 
to extrapolate those across the company. When somebody has a good idea, move it to all the other businesses. That's all our jobs really are, to help those businesses work. Our business at headquarters here is not to kibitz, score, keep, catch. It's to help. It's to assist. It's to make these businesses stronger, to help them grow and be more powerful. We have now our 14 key number, number one and number two businesses. And their job then is to grow through market growth, through volume, and through productivity, the top box, to give earnings, through, through the selective resource allocation within their business. When we give them capital, it's their job then to decide which part of their business gets the capital and which part doesn't get the capital. And that drives the earning stream. To use our assets more effectively gives us more cash. To sell off those things that don't belong, non-strategic disposition, give us cash. <coughs> to take that cash and pay our, our dividends, to make acquisitions, and to then take more, the excess cash and put it back around into the businesses. So that's the fundamental way the company works. That those are our trade-offs on the left, then they do much of the same in each of the businesses. Well, let's take a look at how, how this is all going. First, you take a look at sales growth. And this is an often misunderstood thing about our company in that people sometimes feel we haven't had much top line growth. There's been conversations about why aren't we growing more in the top line at Crotonville and places like that. That's because we've been disposing of a lot of businesses. If you look at the yellow line, and these are the key businesses we have today, they've been growing from 81 to 88 at 8.5% 8 .5 a year. Very strong growth. But the blue line is how we've been reporting things. Because those are the businesses we have, then we sell them off. For example, when we sell $3.5 billion of consumer electronics, that falls out of the sales growth. So that year, you look flat. Whereas, in fact, we have this year, for example, our sales will be about equal to last year. But we've sold $3.5 billion of consumer electronics. So the businesses have grown $3.5 billion. So this yellow line shows our growth. We've got average growth rates going forward through 91. If the GMP is at 1%, we'll do $47 billion. If the GMP is at 3%, we'll do $52 billion, depending on the economy. We'll be in that band. The drivers over here, we've got a computer model for each business that's been developed here by Frank Murphy and his associates that show just exactly what each of these businesses will do, and the add-up of those businesses gives us those volumes. The interesting change in our company, for those of you who have been ar around here a long time, look at the drivers that determine, the two most important drivers as to how big we will be are totally different than GE ever had before. Plastics per auto around the world, how many pounds of plastic on an auto around the world, is probably the single most important driver to our earnings growth. Hospital outlays, how much people are spending on ho hospital equipment, et cetera, is critical to our medical business. The general electric of the past, utility load growth down the bottom, important, still important, but the size and the shifting of our company today shows G financial services, medical systems, and plastics as the key drivers of that top line growth. And so utility load growth is no longer the critical issue it was some time ago. It's important. It's critical to the power generation businesses. It's important to our company, but it's an indication of the shifting mix of the indicators that are there. The next chart is total cost productivity. This company ran between 0.8 and 1.0 in the 70s. As we restructured and resized some of the businesses in the early 80s and had a lot of expense, uh, for uh, income extension aid and a variety of other things, we, we grew at about 1.5% to 2.5% range. We are now up to the 4 to 5% range of total cost output, of total cost productivity, which is the constant dollar output over the constant dollar input. It's the effectiveness of the organization. The budget, as submitted from the operations from the bottom up for next year, is already at 6%. Each percent is worth $300 million pre-tax. So at 6%, we start out with 6 times 300, or a billion eight ahead of the game to cover inflation and all the other things that happen. Now, the fascinating thing about productivity in our company is it's almost a pejorative. 
means whips and chains and beatings and harder work and staying up all night and doing all these things. The Japanese come to work, it's a way of life. It's the way people live. In our company, it's also perceived as, oh, any new business can have high cost, have uh, great total cost productivity, or any high growth business can have great total cost productivity. The amazing thing today is the business with the most total cost productivity in General Electric is 110 years old. It's its oldest business. And its growth is the slowest at 2%. It's lighting. So the lighting business, our oldest and slowest growing, has got productivity of 8.5%. Why? Because they got a mental headset that everybody comes in there aimed at doing things more efficiently, more effectively. It's more fun. And they all understand it. It's part of the business equation. They're all working as a team to do that. They're getting more and more nonsense out of the system, more and more useless paperwork out of the system. They're just doing things more effectively, and they're enjoying it. An interesting sidelight on, on productivity, just to get off for a second. Uh, our medical systems business does about 4.5% productivity now, up from about 1%. we are very proud of it. In Japan, our Yokogawa joint venture does about 8.5% total cost productivity, twice in medical systems. We're very proud of it. But we have a partner there named Shozo Yokogawa, who's been a friend of ours for some 15 years. And he came over to see Chuck Piper, who runs our Yokogawa business in Japan. And he went into his factory. He used to be a 50-50 owner, so he comes less now at 25%. He shows up a little less. He's 70-some years old, a charming, magnificent man, and he's and the kindest fellow in the world. And he says to Chuck, Chuck, this place isn't working very well at 8.5%. Now, we were so proud of it that we were showing everybody in Milwaukee our wonderful Japanese factory. He said, let's get the whole team and go down to Osaka. So next, the next week, this is about a month ago, they all flew through to Osaka. And he took them through one, one of their uh, test factories where they make automated test stands where the total cost productivity is 22% a year. And he wanted to show them how they do it. His own people, because mo mo most of these are all former Yokogawa people. They all became quite chagrined at their progress. They all went back, and they're planning on 15% for next year. As a way, it's a w they get up in the morning every day to do things more efficiently. There's another sidelight story I have. Mazda has a joint venture with Ford. This is sort of a, a unique story, and, and mo most you and GE can, can sympathize with this story. Uh, Don Peterson, who runs Ford, uh, was amazed when he saw how efficient Ma Mazda was in finance, how few people they had. And Ford has an army. It makes our squadron look like a popcorn stand compared <laughs> to this, this army that they have. And so he got a study, study together and he put the two teams together. And then he and the chairman of Mazda met at the, en the end, end of this about th three months ago. And as he tells the story, they asked them for the findings. Why is the Mazda team so much more efficient then the Ford team was really the question. And the chairman of Ma Mazda in the typical conservative Japanese way, and he said, uh, Mr. Peterson, we have looked at this in nine ways. And he said, it's clear that you have the most efficient finance organization one could possibly have. If we wanted to build cars and know all the things you want to know, we'd need just as many people. We just don't know why you want to know all that information about building a car. It has very little to do with building a car. And that's something that we love to do. We love to get tons and tons of information. It's a way of life. They like to do things very simply, in a very human way, and don't need this enormous amount of data to do this. We, we took a picture in Louisville the other day. I don't mean to pick on my associates at major, at, at major appliance. But they took a picture of the computer runs that take place every morning in Louisville. Well, you, you, you know about this. They took a picture of it, and the wall, they, the papers go from the floor to the ceiling all the way along one wall. Every morning, those are ground out. I don't think we, we make more blue or more white or, or more or, orange uh, refrigerators one way or the other based on, on that amount of paper. And so that's a, we got to learn how to do all these things. Same people you, using their minds for more productive, invigorating, exciting things rather than sapping the energy right out of the human uh, spirit. And that's what I think a lot of this is all about. 
But our company now is up to 6%. A remarkable job up from one just 10 years ago and an ability to do it over and over again by just being smarter. This is resource allocation dy dynamics, which are how we give out m money to the businesses that they request to do the job they're after. In the 80s, we poured money into aerospace and aircraft engine, as President Reagan put a lot of money into the defense business. Earnings doubled or tripled. Employment went from 35,000 to close to 70,000. They doubled the number of people. And everyone was rewarded, and the thing was a flourishing business. How many people in this room think we'll have a larger defense budget going forward? I don't think there's anybody. So going forward, this business is not a place that we want to give a lot of money to. This place is in, 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 air, in aerospace in particular. They've got to wrestle through the, some of the changes that are going to take place in their ma marketplace. Their marketplace is shrinking because this country, if it balances its budget, will have to cut back on defense. And over here on the right is what happened to power systems in the 80s. We squeezed them because they had no, no, no market. So they didn't get the resources. Their employment went just the opposite. It went from 35,000 to 17,000 in places like Schenectady and Lynn and Pittsfield. Their earnings also collapsed and went in half. But going to the 90s now, the outlook for power systems is clearly stronger than it is for aerospace. So we'll be giving more money to the upper right, to power systems, and we'll be squeezing the money out of aerospace. So we'll be thought of as kind of nice people in Schenectady and Pittsfield, kind of nice in places like that, and in Valley Forge and places like that, as people are wrenched and, and, and put, put under pressure, uh, there'll, there'll be some difficulties, because those businesses now are facing a different environment. The easier thing for aerospace, unlike some of our, our other businesses, is that it's easier to explain to a broad audience, because communications are the key, key thing. Everyone understands that defense budgets are going down. It's on the front page of every paper and on a bit on television every night. So dealing with it won't feel any bad better, but everyone's aware of the reasons why. On the bottom, we pour money into financial services. GEFS has grown from under $100 million to a budget next year of $930 million. It's grown nine times in the last eight years, and the same thing is true in plastics and medical, as we've poured m m money into those. So the, these people have been getting people and resources to grow. The upper left has, and the upper right has been squeezed. The next thing is working capital efficiency. Up there, it's called asset turnover. This is just the inventories you need to produce the product, the receivables, and how long people take to pay. We, we ran in the 70s in the 3.3 to 3.5 range. That's the capital that was locked up, the dollars that were locked up in inventories and in receivables. We got up to the 4.1 to 4.3 range since about 83. We'll, we'll be at 4.5 next year. Important point of going from that band to that band, that's just being more, more efficient. That's just being smarter. That's just being not having every stock room filled but calling it on, on when you need it. Just simple ways of running more efficiently, smarter. We freed up $2 billion of cash that was just lying dead there because we had stockpiles all around the place that made things easier to work with. The Japanese have almost no inventory because they have things in what's called just in time. And they have supplier systems all built around their factories to deliver them when they call on them. So their inventory tie-ups are almost zero. So that $2 billion of cash, just being more efficient with our, with our suppliers, freed up $2 billion worth of cash and essentially gave us a free Borg Warner. That's what we spent to buy Borg Warner. We got it almost for nothing by the efficiency of running the businesses better. This next chart has probably been the most difficult one, one of all, has caused the most trauma for our employees, is the question of non-strategic dispositions. We sold Utah. Nobody cared. But we bought it in, 80, in 75. It never really became attached. It was an appendage that when it was let go, it didn't hurt. And uh, nobody bothered with it. 
If you take the housewares and central air, air conditioning, when we sold irons and hair dryers, it was a bit of selling our soul in a way, a lot of people felt. If you think about this engine now, this engine has to gen generate cash and earnings. Housewares and air conditioning combined, in good years made $20 million, in bad years lost 20. And their cash was about zero. So they gave us no earnings growth, and they gave us no cash. When we sold them, we got $400 million of cash to restructure power systems and these other strong businesses. Consum consumer electronics, we sold our television businesses. It, it gave people a lot of grief. How could you do that? Consumer electronics in the 80s, the combined RCA and GE consumer electronics businesses lost $150 million. And they used about $170 million of cash. So they didn't give you cash for your engine, and they didn't give you, give you any earnings. All they did was cause more grief in the strong bit businesses, because all they did was pull down on it. The same is true of semiconductor. In semiconductor, which we've just sold now, we lost $160 million in the decade of the 80s, and it used $350 million of cash, drained it right out of the system. Well, how can you have, have an engine that's leaking at that rate? It won't run. So when you, when you explain these things, to, and I've talked to the Elfin Group recently, I wish we had the engine, I wish we had the explanation in more detail when we did these things. They were, it was clear they were more logical to us than they were to a body of people uh, who hadn't thought them through, didn't need to. And uh, this particular issue of selling these properties you have to if you're going to have an engine. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you some more about the engine later on. Power Transformer was in the middle of our G's power businesses. It made everybody feel terrible that we sold Power Transformer. To give you a feeling of Power Transformer, in, 30, in 1985, its sales were lower than they were in 1970. And in 13 of those 15 years, it lost money. It cumulatively lost $150 million briefly. It didn't belong. It had no sense. It, it just dragged the whole institution down and put that, those things put pressure on the other businesses. They make you make the wrong decisions with the good businesses as they keep leaking. And so that's a very, for selling those, we got eight and a half billion dollars of cash that we used in this engine to do other things with. Here's the engine's performance. Earnings this year will be $3.4 billion, $3 billion. In 1991, they'll be about $5 billion. So that's a source of cash up in that box on the right, that $3.4 to $5 billion. We use cash. We give about 40% of the cash to the share owners in dividends. So the cash now, 40% of that number is $1.4 this year, and about $2 billion in 1991 will go to share owners out the back. G Financial Services uses about a billion dollars a year. We give them a billion dollars a year to grow their business. They take that. Depreciation provides us, gives us cash of about a billion six. That's now about equal to the capital we, we need with the businesses we kept. So that's about even. There's no problem there. That asset productivity, by operating more efficiently, I, I mentioned that in the other chart, that gives us about two to four hundred million dollars a year, and that covers what you need for the growth in your volume. We're going to dispose of small things now. We're through the big dispositions, and that will give us a couple hundred million dollars a year. And then there's a ratio of debt to capital. If you keep that constant, you can borrow half a billion to a billion dollars, which says that every year, the bottom line of this ins and outs is that this engine, every year, after spending for plant, after investing a billion dollars or more in R&D, has two to three billion dollars of free cash flow now. Not being drained by power transfer, not being drained by semiconductor, not being drained by consumer electronics, not being drained by housewares. Everybody giving cash now. So we have two to three billion dollars every year to do anything we want with. Buy companies, buy stock back, give dividends, to do the things a company has to do to win in world markets. And that is the critical part of what this engine produces. What do we do with that cash? 
but we buy companies. The bottom line is we bought 16 billion. We buy businesses to enhance our number one position. So we buy businesses that stick on to strong businesses. CCGR for medical, Borg Warner for plastics, Roper for appliances, RCA, which gave us a whole series of businesses. We've learned what to do and what not to do. Direct graft to a strong business, that works. Give medical a business, they can make it work. All the sins, the mistakes, they can hide it. They're strong enough to get it, to nurture it, to bring it along so it works. Buy large independent businesses with, le with leadership positions like NBC, like Employers Reinsurance. Employers Reinsurance, that little co company in Kansas City, will make $320 million this year, 10% of General Electric. In Kansas City, with a very small team of specialized re reinsurance people. Don't do this. Don't buy little businesses that haven't reported to us here. That's a, an absolute one-act disaster. I mean, we buy it, we put it there, it reports to us, they get in, tr in tr trouble, they have nobody to help them, they get more help than they need, and the whole thing craters, and we're great at that. Fortunately, we learned early on little ones. So if, if I had to say what have been the home runs and what haven't, we have hit doubles, triples, and home runs on 15 billion of this. Kid of Peabody has been difficult. We're going to break about even this year on a total cost basis, although Kid of Peabody will make about $45 million, but it costs us that to carry them. So that'll be about a break, break even. And then this two or $300 million of Kelmer and ceramics and stuff like that has cost us another $300 million or so. So 15 out of 16 billion have delivered enormous earnings. In RCA, we get 45 cents a share this year out of the RCA acquisition. So enormous strengthening of the company from those. And we took a few swings and didn't hit, hit them out of the park also. But if you don't go to bat, and it's an important lesson from everybody here, you got no chance to knock, knock one out of the park. The game is knock more out of the park than you knock <laughs> foul balls with. So here we are with that $16 billion has been spent for that. We have a lot of discussion in our company about short-term and long-term. Are we too short-term oriented? Is American business too short-term oriented? The only reason anybody has a title of manager or any of these things is because their job is to manage short and long. Balancing resources allocating yes to some, no to others, and no maybes is what good management's all about. Weak management's about sprinkling it everywhere, lots of maybes, give everything, give, give, give every pro project a little, win the popularity cook contest for the week, and sink the business. And the issue here is every quarter, every year, we have improved our earnings. Over the eight years, which is long time, we've grown 11%. And over the last two years, we've grown at 17%. So it's been stronger at the end than it was in the beginning. The short and long is there. And our managers everywhere have to get across, because anybody can manage short. All you do is go in for two years, squeeze everything, and look like a hero. Or anybody can manage for the long, long term. Go in and say, I'm going to deliver in 95. Don't bother me until then. It's an easy game, one, one or the other. The hard game is balancing it. And that's what our people have to understand their job. There are people like Allegis. Some of you may remember Alleg Allegis, former United Airlines. They bought a hotel chain, Weston. They bought Hertz, and they were going to have a total transportation system. They'd drive you there, they'd fly you there, then put you in bed. Do the whole thing, control the whole system. And they had no earnings, but they had a lot of talk for the 90s. They're now all busted up, as you know. Federated department stores had no short-term earnings, but a grand strategy for covering every shopping center with Bloomingdale's from A to Z uh, in the country. No short-term earnings. You know the story there. Campo bought them, broke them up, and they're now gone. So one of the things in all your long-term grand plans, you better be getting short-term results while you're getting your long-term plans in order. This tries to show why GE is a growth company. Uh, the top chart there is just a numerical ex exercise. GNP, 
growing at one, two, or three. And you read that every quarter in the paper as to what, what it was. Inflation, we're saying, is somewhere between four, four and a half and six percent, the second column. All the next column does is give you the nominal GNP. It's an addition of column one and column two to give you those, which is what it is in current year dollars. And then if we're going to grow at one and a half to two times that GNP, another arithmetic exercise to give you at 1% GNP, we, we better have earnings of 8 to 14. And at 3% GNP, we better have growth of 11 to 18. That's just arithmetic. Not, 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 nothing to do with GE above the dotted line. Down below are how we're positioned to capitalize on this. This is bottoms up with a model. This is also the LRFs from the oil, oil organization. Three businesses represent 40% of our company's earnings. G financial services, plastics, and medical. Three relatively new businesses represent 40% of our earnings. Their earnings growth over the next three years is somewhere between 15% and 25%. You multiply those two columns and you get 6% to 10%. So we start off with those three high growth businesses giving us 6 to 10%. Then these other businesses down below, these 11 here, slower growth give, gives us that weighted earnings. And so we end up with earnings of 9 to 16 percent, depending on a growth rate of 1 or 3 percent. So we can back that up with forecasts from the bottoms up, as well as modeling by Frank and his associates to give us these numbers. So clearly we can grow at 1.5 to 2 times the GMP. We've done it the last two years. Our forecasts say we'll do it for the next three, so we'll have five straight years if we deliver for the next three as we have in the last two. But so we are, we think, without question, a growth company. Now let me tell you a little more about how we got this engine to get there, because this is the trauma that we've all been through. We started out with 411,000 employees. We acquired 106,000 employees with these acquisitions. Enormous. We sold in the businesses that, that were there. People in those businesses re represented some 109,000 people. And we restructured or downsized or whatever words you want to use to get more efficient, some 123,800 people in the third goal. So we now have 284,000 people today. An enormous in and out. It's, uh, it's a tribute to our people that we had a strong bank balance sheet to be fair to people. We treated them one by one, that the whole thing didn't break in taking a transition from that size with that many in, that many out in acquisitions, plus the restructuring. But we're doing 31% more volume with 31% fewer people. And that gets you to why we have to get at stopping doing everything the way we used to do it. There is no way that we can continue to do everything the way we used to do it and have any kind of a quality of life and enjoyment and expansion and innovation if, in fact, we do all the things we did back in 81 with that many people. Now let me give you a little calculation, though, to show you why we can't add it all back. If you take 123,000 people and you assume that the whole mix of all the employees that are gone had an average salary of $35,000, you add benefits, and that's conservative. You add benefits to that, you have to close to 50. You multiply that by, that by the tax rate, and you multiply that by 123,000 people, and you get $6 billion minus taxes of 2.4, or about $4 billion. And General Electric would be losing close to a $1 billion today if we were operating the same businesses with the same, in the same way as we did in 1981 losing a billion dollars. We would be either allegious or federated. You pick the one that we might be. So the option then is not to go back to the way we had it. The option is to do it differently. And that's why this enormous pressure, these enormous groups that are looking at trying to take valueless work out of the system. This next chart give, gives you another sense of, of an issue for employees in the field. 40% of our earnings I showed you come in the top three or three businesses there. They're growing 60 to 70% of the company's earnings, these top three. But only 15% of the people on the far right column reside in these businesses. So when the faculties at Crow Crotonville 
talking about high growth, exciting company. 85% of the people in the crowd are staring at them saying, what the hell are you talking about? I don't feel this. I'm not in that game. I don't know what you're talking about. So the engine's going on, and they're giving a wonderful speech about growth and excitement, but only 15% of the people are feeling that piece of the action, if that's what their objective is, earnings growth. However, you look at the next chart of the engine, which needs cash to work, and these top three exciting businesses are a disaster. All they do is use our money to grow. And so the important thing is, in these top businesses, in these middle businesses, we're going to get $9 billion of the cash. These are cash businesses. They generate cash. 85% of the pe people are going to generate 90% of the cash so this engine works. That's almost like the gas to make this engine work. Everybody has a role, but it means we've got to compensate people in these businesses differently than those in the high growth businesses. We've got to talk to them about different issues about cash rather than earnings growth. We like to say we have b b businesses with big E and no C, big earnings, no C. That's GE financial services. They don't, they use every nickel we can give them, but they grow earnings dramatically and give us the EPS we need. We have a business like plastics, which is big E and small C. They give us a little cash, a lot of earnings. NBC, which is growing very slowly now as people are going to VCRs and other things, Gives us very little earnings growth, 5% say, but gives us four to $500 million a year of cash for the engine. So they're critical for the cash standpoint of making the thing work. So that's why everyone has a role, but we can't have a faculty up there talking about growth all day. We've got to talk about what everyone's role is and what the, the purpose of this talk is in the field will be to give the talk and then have the people in the businesses describe their, their, their businesses and how their businesses fit in the engine, where they fit, what their role is, what they do, and how they're going to be rewarded for it. It raises a number of human resource issues across the company that have to be communicated by every leader in the business. It says that every number one or number two business has a critical role. All of them are critical. And people should be rewarded for the role they're in, either earnings growth and or cash. And each biz business, as long as they're number one or number two, will be ready depending on the environment they're in. I, I like to use the analogy, we've got 14 racehorses. Depending on the environment, we've got thoroughbreds to run in every single race. And we don't have any more dogs draining us leaking out of the engine at any one point in time. So if you have 14 thoroughbreds, the defense environment was great in the 80s. NBC had fantastic years in 86, 87, 88, as their ratings exploded and were number one network. Power systems, we, we even forget how important they were to us in the early 80s as we sold pro products out of the backlog of power systems. And they'll be strong again in the 90s. And medical systems has been growing in importance all during the 80s. We've got to do a better job over here in the education and training issue for professionals below level 15. I didn't highlight on the chart here, but our mix in the early 70s was two hourly to one salary. In the early 80s, it was one and a half hourly to one salary. But our business has changed so much that it's now less than one hourly employee per one salaried employee. So we've got a, we have a strong union relations organization in the company, our hourly employee organization. And we have a strong executive management operation in the company. We've got a gap here in the levels 1 through 14. So we've got to really do a lot more focus on the education and training and reward systems in the 1 through 14 area. And we've got to find a way with this liberated management system to get more business-specific issues on workout. And we'll be having. As a result of some work done by this Crotonville faculty and headed up by Jack Pfeiffer and Jim Baum, Bauman and those people, Jim Bauman is heading up a, a work workshop that will be traveling all around the, co the country, working with each business to develop the mechanisms for two and a half day seminars with the business leader there at the beginning of the session 
them there at the end of the session so that people can work on what they can do themselves and what they need support from the management for to get work out. Because we have to take, we have to go in a concentrated effort to get the massive programs out of the system. We are doing it now. We've got some tremendous exa examples in finance around, around here at corporate where we have changed some very simple systems to make dramatic improvements. I can tell you how many silly little things that, 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 that we do. Uh, I'll give you one, one example we had the other day, which is the quarterly closing. General Electric closes its books every quarter. Well, since 1970-something, we have been very proud of being first to report every quarter. The only problem was none of us knew we were proud to be first to report every quarter. We had this objective of doing it, and no one ever thought about it. So we had finance people closing the books on a Wednesday, working all weekend, analyzing, coming in, leaving their families to get the stuff in Monday morning. None of us care. Well, in a group that all got, got, all got together and sat and talk, talked about it, we moved the closing back a week and changed dramatically, I think, the workload on the organization that had to do this thing for no purpose at all. Now, we've come up with a number of things here in these finance uh, teams that are here today. have done a number of things. But it's not just finance. It's across the whole company in every function. We've got to examine all the work we're going to do. Who cares? There's got to be the question about what some of the paperwork we're doing. Why are we doing it? Who uses it? We've got to do, do things with our management roles, like ask everybody, what are the five things your people have to come to get approval from you to do? Okay, why do they come to you? To make you feel powerful? To make you feel like a leader? You don't trust them? What are the reasons? Why not give them all to them? And if they're not the right people, change them and get the right people that you can trust and liberate and free to do things so they can enjoy, have a more fulfilling job, and take on more challenges. That's the challenge. The challenge is to get rid of the minutia for minutia's sake. And it's an enormous challenge. It's a challenge that every one of us in this room and everyone in the company ha has to go after. Because this engine is unique. And it creates positive, future-oriented opportunities like no other company in the world. There is nothing that's ever been created like it. It's got 14 number one businesses. They're all thoroughbreds. No one of them is more than 25% of the total. They can all win in any environment. It throws off 2 to $3 billion every year of cash to get stronger in. And it's been rewarded for that. From 81 to 88, our earnings have grown, as I said, 11%. The S&P 500 companies have grown 7%, and the Dow Jones Industrial Average has grown 7%. Our share owners, while suffering a bit in 88, for the whole period, 81 to today, have returned, gotten a return of 22% a year against 16% for the S&P 500 and some 12% for the Dow Jones Industrial. So we've earned about 50% more on a rate 11 versus 7 than our peers, and we've been rewarded at 22% versus 16 and 12. So the engine works. The engine now has the, uh, the weak businesses out of it, and the challenge for us all going forward is to add more stronger businesses to it, reinvest smartly to grow what we have, and with the exception of our aerospace business, where we don't know just what the environment's going to be going forward, what Congress will do. Most of our businesses have now, are now positioned clearly to deal with almost any environment that they have to deal with going forward. So that's the story I wanted to give you a flavor for. It may be a little more than you wanted to know about penguins, but we have a feeling, I hope, now about how this penguin works. <laughs>